please join me in welcoming both of them uh, to the floor. Hello, Chloe. Hi, Justin. Oh, does my microphone work? Yeah. How's everything sounding? How's everything sounding? I've learned in my time you have to give like 20 seconds of sound test just to make sure everything. And we've yeah. got a big thumbs up. So I think okay, that we're good, good to go. Um, so I'm feeling a little bit like a, like a balloon animal at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> um, I was almost like, just don't read the bio. Don't read the bio. But um, no, I, I, so I feel like I need to legitimize my place up here just just a little <laughs> just a little bit. Why is this guy sitting next to next to Chloe? And um, I, it is not through any professional means or, or writerly means, even though. I think we connect on that wavelength Absolutely. Uh, quite a bit, but it is is through my wife, Kate Lorenz, um, who had the uh, had the good fortune. Uh, I had the good fortune of 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 meeting uh, when I was getting my MFA, and then ultimately following here to Lawrence, Kansas, where we've we've been for a while. And I still remember when I met you. Um, I was I was I was brought to the bourgeois pig mm -hmm. uh, on, on a dark and rainy night and sat down. Uh, and, and I was told that it was to, to meet uh, a very important friend. Uh, but the longer I was sitting there and then when I saw you coming in, I thought, oh, I'm, a, I think I'm at a job interview. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Well, no. So I sort of like straightened my posture, which is going to be terrible yeah. all night tonight. Uh, and, uh, and I had my first amazing conversation with you. Uh, and it's, and it's been a hallmark of, of my relationship with you since since that day mm -hmm. uh countless hours i almost feel like we should have like brought in the couch from our living i know room we, we right? spend a lot of time laying yeah. on the couch and having Blankets, these conversations and, and chinese yeah. food and so yeah. we'll try to simulate that here for you i think I th that would be the most effective thing but um i also just feel i know giselle sort of touched on it but you know i'm seeing a lot of really friendly familiar faces which which puts me at ease of course i don't know if it does the same for you but i think i see a lot of faces that are full of of pride for you, what you've done, um, what you've brought back to us. And, and so again, I just wanted to say, we're so proud of you, Chloe. And, Thank you. and start with that. Thank you. Um, Wait, I have to say yeah. at the end of this job interview, um, <laughs> where you met Kate, who's been my lifelong best friend. So it was, of course, you know, I was judging him, but they, it was raining as Justin said, and they were walking out to the car and Justin just put his arm over and pretended to be an umbrella over Kate's <laughs> head and i said she's gonna marry him and she did so you passed yeah. yep yep that's the, the extent of my comedic career of course it's just <laughs> keeping my relationships healthy it was very charming and okay. i remember it well yeah. uh well uh, i just wanted to start uh and maybe give everybody an opportunity i'm sure we have many uh readers and and repeat readers of your of your just incredible book easy beauty but i'm wondering if you can sort of establish for us the the conditions that motivated the book. So uh, you touch on this a little bit in the book itself and conversations that you had with friends uh, in New York who are really pressing you on, on, on sort of what you had dedicated your writerly life to. Yeah. Um, and and seeing if if there was a possibility of taking a turn uh, or, or just exploring a new direction. So yeah. um, I, I know it, it, we talked a lot about KU already. I don't know if this book got its start here at, at KU. I think it started elsewhere. So just kind of give us the yeah. origin story of Easy Beauty. No, I mean, it, in my skill set started here. I mean, I learned so much here as a writer. The book did not begin here. It began in New York. And the very beginning of the book finds me sitting at a bar. I was doing my PhD in philosophy at the time. And I was sitting at a bar with two friends of mine um, who were both in my philosophy department. And it was just like a beautiful evening and having some drinks and laughing and talking. And through the course of a uh, discussion about a bioethics case, one of the men next to me, my friend said, uh, well, made an argument that disabled lives were inherently um, inferior, that they were less worth living, and that anybody who um, found themselves pregnant should have to be forced to do testing and abort um, a life like mine or a body like mine. So that is what... Um, you know, the, that's sort of the inciting incident that begins this book, but not because that was a new or unusual statement to me. Um, eugenics has been, of course, part of 
uh, our history and, and the world's history, eugenicist arguments are made constantly, um, not just about disability. We're always finding ways in which I was making this joke. I talked to some students here today um, and I was trying to um, explain this a little bit. And I was saying, you know, like I can even fall prey to um, a kind of thinking that I think motivates the logic of, of eugenics, which is I want to live forever and I want to be my peak best self. And I, I, get, I, this is a horrible thing, but I got on TikTok just to like Google, like it, it, internet people tell me how to live forever, you know? And, <laughs> and, and if you do that, they'll be like, here's what you've got to do. You've got to eat spirulina. You have to look at the sun for 10 minutes and you have to exercise for, for 35 minutes, but if 34, you're dead. Um, and you got to drink this much, you know, and, and there's this sort of anxiety that comes with having a body and being alive and being afraid of, of illness or change or mortality that says, I've got to be peak, peak, peak condition. And part of that thinking is just absolutely human and, and um, I have no judgment for it. But of course, taken to an extreme, we start looking at ways in which uh, other people represent deficits or we think of deficits in ourself and then we work to eradicate those things. And those, that way of thinking taken to extreme is the basis of uh, so much prejudice, genocide, enslavement, um, eugenicist movements across history. So I say all this to say that these men who are making this argument were far from the first people to say any of that to me. I'd been living with this idea that uh, from so many angles of society that there was something about my body that was inherently lesser. What actually is the inciting incident of this book is that I recognize that in that moment, I don't wanna engage with them and I don't want to defend myself. What I wanna do is retreat. And I wanna go into what I, have always called this thing in my separated space in my mind called the neutral room, which is a way of sort of dissociating from reality. And I want to stay in that separated space rather than, rather than defend my existence, which maybe you can have some empathy for. It's like Friday night. I just want to have a beer. Like sometimes you don't want to defend your existence over a beer, you know? Um, but I recognize I had done this many, 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 many times in my life, this sort of retreat into dissociation from social discomfort or retreat from the possibility of social prejudice I don't wanna face. I'd done that again and again and again in my life. It was the first time though that I recognized that that retreat and that silence was a form of complicity and complicity with the worst beliefs, not just beliefs about my body, but beliefs about disabled bodies in general. And I, for the first time, really recognized that that was not uh, a way that it was acceptable for me to live my life. But knowing that isn't like this automatic, it's not like, oh, okay, I figured it out. And then all of a sudden you have this great speech to give these assholes at the bar, you know, that's not, that's just not how it works. So the book is really a journey, I think, for a lot in a quest, a really, a really specifically structured quest to do a few things. One, get comfortable enough with my body and my identity so that I can form a language to speak from. That required a lot of education, time, and self-reflection. But then even more importantly, to do all of those things so that I could be a better model, not just for myself or for people that are thinking about disability, but for my son, who's here in my cool leather jacket looking looking so good in it that I realized I have to give it to him um, because I didn't want my son to see complicity um, in the face of dehumanizing language. And that's how I had been living my, my life. So that's really the, the impetus of the book. And then I spend about 18 months traveling and thinking and reflecting and each chapter sort of shows a different place in the journey to, for that acceptance for the acquisition of important language and for the hope that I can be a better model to the person that matters most to me. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the, the paperback, which is out now, and, and can I say, it's already entered its second printing, so yeah. congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, yeah.
the paperback features the, the two of you together and, and talking about inciting incidents, I think it's really, um, I mean, it, it struck me that you found a, a moment that if you were in a different state of mind or a different place in your life, it's a moment that where you would have retreated, yeah. it would have passed and you possibly would have forgotten about it. And I think so many people would think, well, the, inc the inciting incident, right? The, 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 the event that really is going to motivate the journey is motherhood. But in actuality, motherhood came as quite a surprise. Yes, it did. Sure did. Uh, and yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I'm wondering just that just that journey in and of itself from from realizing yeah you've got Wolfgang in you yes <laughs> yes to realizing that you know there's there's a an additional responsibility on your part to to model that behavior. So what what was that? was that path to motherhood through motherhood yeah. like uh, for you? Well, that change of Wolfgang arriving very shockingly into my life, um, uh, that I think in a lot of ways, that was, a, of course, like such a formative experience, not just motherhood itself, but the drastic perceptual shift that my life became. And that actually ends up being like the kind of core architecture of the book is if you look at the book, if you read it, uh, you know, um, you'll see on nearly every page, there's an example of a perceptual shift. And sometimes those perceptual shifts are really subtle and minor, like the sun coming through a window and it changes literally the way I can see my neighbor um, on a train. Sometimes those perceptual shifts are grand sort of narrative reframings that my mother is giving me when I'm telling her about my birth and she's going, that's not happened, how it happened at all. You're totally wrong about everything. Um, or I'm lost in a, in a sculpture and suddenly I, I'm constantly feeling a perceptual shift around me. And I wrote the book that way because so much of my experience of motherhood was this grand lens, um, you know, just completely new lens on, on so much. One just being that I could get pregnant at all. Um, and this is something I learned later was very common for disabled women is that they're just told they can't get pregnant. And my mother and I had been told I couldn't get pregnant and we just sort of trusted our doctors. And for some reason, I don't think we ever really knew fully why that was, or they gave us reasons that we didn't question. I found out later, there's a great um, article about this called what happened to you. And the reason why the articles called that is that for pregnant disabled women, a lot of times people just come up and say, well, what happened to you? And then I'll say like the normal thing, like <laughs> just that standard. Remember we've human. got kids in the audience tonight, which I, I know is normal. strange for this kind yeah, of event, but no, it's going to set some uh, I parameters. Said the normal, yeah, they know they were born like they, you know, it had this anyway. Um, Sorry to the Rolfs. Uh, no. Um, but uh, that was, that's what I had been told. And then when I started having pregnancy symptoms, I was just like, oh, I must be dying or I must, must be something else. Um, and I, re I, I remember at the you, time yeah, you, you were exercising like mad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was doing Pilates on Wolfgang. Poor yeah. baby. Well, you know, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. knowing it. Probably not getting the right nutrition because it was no. all focused on, you know, like, like green drinks and things like yeah. that. And, and we were all, we were, we went to this 4th of July celebration, at, which at that point I would have been like six months pregnant. <laughs> and, did, and I was like, am I gaining weight? And my best friend was like, you look great. No, not at all. You're not. And there's this picture of me that, which we call the pregnant picture because I looked so pregnant and I kept going guys I think I look pregnant and they were like no no you look look great because You're glowing. we didn't know we didn't know <laughs> um and turns out it was it was a whole child yeah. um so yeah I was I was like five and a half months pregnant before I knew um that Wolfgang was coming it was quite a shock so that was a huge perceptual shift in a lot of ways in the sense that um one of the difficult things about about that shock is if you're told your whole life you can't have kids, then you don't allow yourself the narrative imagination of what it might be like to become a parent. So if you think you can have kids or you don't, you know, maybe you don't want to have kids, you at least allow yourself that question. What do I want? What would I be like as a parent? What would my, you know, partner be like as a parent? What kind of part? 
But I just didn't have that at all. So when Wolfgang came, it was this massive narrative shift of not just what my body was capable of, but what my life could look like. Um, the other thing is that I felt as though a lot of the stories I'd been told about parenthood were ones of, especially for women, complete sacrifice. Like you have to give up on your art, you have to give up on your dreams. I was right about to move to New York to do a second PhD, which is really ill-advised. It probably would have been better if you'd stopped me from that. But, um, <laughs> but I had a lot of dreams and I had a lot of hopes and I saw all of them go away, like disappear. That's really what I thought parenthood would do to me. And of course, the biggest and most welcome perceptual shift in my life is that Wolfgang is what makes this art possible. This book, of course, would never exist without him. Um, but also that uh, parenthood has allowed me to connect to a grand universal tradition and experience, which I think has only made me a more sensitive and more capable artist. But he's also been the reason why I have to figure out how to get over my own defenses, get over my own coping strategies that maybe were worthy of my life, but are not worthy of his. And when I saw a lot of my own defenses mirrored in his behavior, I knew that I had to shift. And one of the most annoying things about being a parent is you can't just be like, don't be like me. <laughs> <laughs> Try to do it the other way. You know, it's like, no, you have to actually deal with yourself. Um, well, and, and, that, and yeah. that you don't, you don't know that you need to tell them to stop being like you until yeah. they've reflected until it back at you did, immediately, yeah. right? You, you can't preempt that and go, before you adopt yeah, just this behavior no. of mine, <laughs> I, I'm not going to want you to do that. Yeah. Uh, so, and, but I know that, um, and another beautiful aspect of, of this very beautiful book is how, you know, that, that access to the experience of motherhood also gives you new access to the experience of your own mother and yeah. your parents. Uh, and, and you, and you really have a, you have a wingman or, or maybe more of a drill sergeant in your mother yeah. who, who, um, you know, is, is a mirror for all of the, all of the right reasons. Right. Um, yeah. re reflecting back at you, those, those, those things that maybe you need to, to observe in yourself and, and possibly work on it in yourself. So can you can you talk about how that that change happened then between you, your mother, your father, and how yeah. really that's reflected in the book? Yeah, I mean, it's a really hard thing to write about your parents, obviously, um, or to try to write about anybody and, and really tell them as whole people. And there's no way, I mean, people that know my mother, some people have known my mother for a long time that are here, they know that the entirety of her essence is, is impossible to capture and the same is true of my father, who is a very complex person. And so what I really needed to do in this book is just look at two aspects of them and how those two aspects were really complicating my own life and how I was trying to find some peace. And I think one of the best and simplest ways of explaining that is I say in the book, my parents introduced their, the first ideas of what art could be to me. And they both had their own, and I think really equally valid ideas of what art could be. So my mother introduced art into my life through making every aspect of our everyday life better, through making incredibly inventive and creative meals, um, through almost never making the same soup twice, just sort of her, her genius soups. Um, can, but can, yeah. a, can a soup and, ever be the same twice though? Well, Maybe, not, <laughs> my, not my house, I don't know about you. But, you know, just, or like um, sewing things on my clothes and painting my my headboards and, and dressers. And she just, and painting the walls of our house and making all this art that hangs, you know, hidden in, in our bathrooms that, that are so beautiful. And she just enriched the everyday with an aesthetic quality. My father, I think, really admired the great, poets and writers and musicians and philosophers and really taught me that art was this sort of deep, deep dive into the self or taking in the world through observation and then from the self making something like resting from the self your sort of singular vision or perspective or genius and then sort of giving it to the world and the those are really great ideas of art the problem is that for my father, that 
that desire and that drive led him away from us and out of our lives. And I think for my mom, her ability to see beauty everywhere led her deeper into connection with her family, with her present, with the people that she loves, certainly with me. And so the, the problem is, though, that both of those people are in me and both of those people um, drive my desires. So for a long time, I really felt like the thing I needed to do because my father's fate was not the one that I wanted to have was that I needed to like kill that part of myself. But so much of what my mother does in the book is show me that there's a way of synthesizing those things and being at peace, being an artist who both goes out and is creative and does the work they want to do, but never leaves home as well or brings home with her. And so when I'm writing about them, I'm really focused on that point and that sort of tension within myself, how that shapes the parent that I can be. And so that's really the, the threads that I'm isolating from my parents. But I think more than that, my mother is clearly the hero of the book, if you've read it. And part of that is because she forces me through drill sergeant, yeah, uh, <laughs> factual corrections, um, to revisit my narratives. And I think that that's the book is at its core is about growth. And I think that the most tangible way to represent growth for any of us is whether or not we have the ability to revisit, recast, and reflect on the narratives that we tell about ourselves, about our past, about who we are, about what our limitations are, what other people's limitations are, what other people are thinking of us. When we can look at those and, and recast them, that's how we grow. And my mother's role in the book, quite intentionally, because this is the role in my life, is to constantly come in when I'm down the wrong narrative and, and do some course correcting. So it is through, through that that I'm really led to growth. And then, of course, that influences the way that I'm trying to lead Wolfgang. Yeah. 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 So, so being able to revisit your own narratives um, led you to write a memoir. Yeah. About, full of your own narratives that so, are often wrong. I'm always wrong in this book too. And, yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if you can, if you can make, because you know, there's the experience of writing the memoir, of course, which is sort of, I guess the initial confrontation, right. Of those yeah. narratives and trying to figure out how am I going to work with these? How am I going to, you know, in some ways aestheticize them and in which way, which ways am I going to sort of strip them of, of style or, or aesthetic to try to get to a truth. And then the book is created and then you spend over a year, reading from it repeatedly and yeah, talking yeah. about it repeatedly. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering in what ways the narratives that are captured in the book, in the ways they're captured in the book, um, have already started to seem like they need reappraisal again. Oh yeah, well, that's mean. That's a mean question. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's totally right. Yeah, get rid of that book, gosh. I mean, I think we probably, if, I mean, there's a lot of people I know in this room who are makers, who are artists in their own right. And of course we hate what we are done with, right? Like it's so humiliating to look at, to look back and go, oh my God, yeah. Um, but I think that, I think that the, the incredible thing about talking about this book for a year is that I'm finding things in it because people are showing me their own entry points into the book or they're helping me re-understand what I've written. Like I'm like rediscovering things in the book. So it's less that I want things recast or, or change. I mean, I always want to rewrite every time I read out loud, I just rewrite as I'm reading. Um, but it's more that like the book is sort of grown for me because it, do, it really doesn't feel like mine at all anymore. It feels like everybody who's read it and has shared experiences, it's like they've added their little bookmarks to it or they've added their underlines or they've added their marginalia. And now the book feels wider and um, I hope more inviting. It feels more like inviting to me as a sort of an opening of conversation about other people's narratives and, and where they have found kinship. So that has been shocking to me in the best way. Um, things that I still felt closed about getting to talk about the book with people and see 
how it's affected them has opened me further. So the process that I'm after in the book, which is deeper connectedness with other people, deeper self-knowledge, like the process of then talking about the book for years, like carried that project out in ways, of course, I could never have anticipated. Yeah, I suppose you, you can never start a project thinking like, I'm going to build a community by creating No, this. yeah, you don't think that. You're just like, oh. This thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and community is such a big part of the book. And I think it's, it's a big part of your narrative because, I mean, something that's always astonished me. I mean, it felt for several years there, <laughs> you'd come back here to Lawrence or, or we would see you and you would say like, oh, by the way, I'm, um, I'm writing about tennis now. <laughs> and we would go, do you even know how tennis is played? And no, you were not really, that, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, or, or um, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, I think that I'll just go to Sundance and become like a cultural critic and a movie critic yeah. and meet all these. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you've created a community, you've gotten to see how this book can do that. But I, I think in some ways you've, in some ways you're fearless about entering those communities and in other ways you've realized that there is fear to be had and in, in trying to enter. So what has pushed you successfully into trying to enter those new contexts um, sort of yeah. with such abandon? Well, there's, yeah, there's a friend in the book that kind of calls me out on this a little bit um, in that, like, I just kept being like, well, I got one degree, I'll get another and a subject I've never studied or, or like, oh, I'll go, yeah, I'll write about tennis. And, and I guess I'll start by just Googling tennis. Um, <laughs> Which is really what I got. As long as you didn't get on TikTok to watch tennis TikTok. That's, now I do. Now, yeah, I didn't have TikTok in 2017. Thing. But yeah, I just pitched a tennis story to GQ. And they were like, sure, you can do this. And I was like, I better Google tennis really fast. <laughs> um, and then I was their tennis writer for a year. It was amazing. And I'm uh, best friends with Roger Federer, as you well know. And um, Don't say that because that's like not that uh, unbelievable anymore. Oh, it's true. Right? But based on the people that you fraternize with now, it's like <laughs> I, I would believe. Yeah, so, so um, or writing, yeah, just jumping into Sundance and being terrible at, at that, but figuring it out. Um, I think that in in all of these cases, there's a great side that I love. Um, I'm making these decisions because of a certain fearlessness, a certain like belief in my curiosity, a belief that my curiosity is worth pursuing at all costs, that that I can do anything I want if I just sort of put myself in the position to do it. Um, a tremendous amount of like delusional behavior that leads to greatness. I don't know. I, I said this before, but I think delusion is a really underrated um, part of making art. Like if we really thought about what we're doing, um, we would never do it. Like there's, you know, there's actresses in this room, there's writers in this room, musicians in this room. And if we really thought about the odds, none of us would have done or made the things that we've made. So um so that side, but then I think the darker side, and this is what my friend kind of calls me out on, is he says, uh, you want to be a novice because then you can always be an outsider. And that was right, right? That's the negative side of this, this jumping from thing to thing, is if you're always a novice, then nobody has really any expectations for you. You don't have any um, ownership of community. Nobody can tell you that you're really doing it wrong because you know you're doing it wrong because that's the point. And I could remain at the margins of things. And because disability had already, or not disability itself, but, but people's perceptions or bad ideas about disability had already put me on the margins, felt very safe there. Yeah. And I think the most dangerous community to me to really fully enter and embrace was the disability community itself because I was fighting so hard against the labels that come along with claiming any community. I didn't want to be pinned down by those labels. And the second you claim a community, you claim all the baggage and all the labels and all the stereotypes. And my friend says to me in the book, well, but there's an obvious problem with not claiming community. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, you're alone. <laughs> and there are ways in which that aloneness feels safer and more natural to me than any other thing, than connecting with any other person. So to stay a novice in these ways allowed me to kind of like perform socially acceptable solitude. 
Um, and breaking free of that is, you know, took a, took a long time. Yeah. 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 Well, and I'm, one of the, the moments in the book that, that strikes me, you, you detail in, in one of the Lawrence passages and there, there are sections about Lawrence. So you can, you can look forward to that if you haven't read it. Um, but you, you form a relationship with somebody, uh, and you know, it sort of grows and, and, and there's a, there's a kind of a courtship, which is really beautifully rendered by you. Uh, and it sort of culminates in this moment where the two of you are together. Um, and, and then you pull away yeah. from that interaction. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, you know, it made me think about those, those other moments in which you felt like, did I'm, I guess the question is, did you feel like a novice in that moment too? Well, I think it goes back to that narrative confirmation thing. He's talking about a, a part, one part, and there's multiple parts like this in the book where a narrative could be broken. So in this situation, I'm, I'm, I've, you know, have a crush on someone and we're going to kiss and it's going to be great. And I'm so excited and love is great and romance is great. And then I have this moment where I recognize like, oh, but I'm a disabled person. I'm excluded from romance. And even though the present reality of that moment says otherwise, the narrative is stronger and louder. And I, I absent myself from that moment, but it's not just that the narrative is loud. It's that the narrative was safe and breaking free of narratives and reframing narratives. Again, that's growth, but growth is painful. And so staying stuck in narratives feels good um, and is, is safer. And another moment that's sort of similar is when I go on the tennis tour, part of what I'm doing is, I'm assuming that athletes are going to be unkind to me. And part of the reason I assume that is um, because of projection, because I represent possibly their worst fears, which is any sort of physical decline or frailty. And I know when you represent or embody somebody's fears, projection means that their, their disgust or anger at you can be higher. And the truth of the tennis tour is that almost everybody was amazing to me except for one athlete who, who I write about in the book, um, sees me walking toward him and starts mimicking my walk and making fun of my walk and then says, what the fuck is that? And I was relieved when that happened. I wasn't angry or hurt. And I, I thought to myself, yes, there it is. That's it. That's what I've been looking for. I've been waiting and waiting for my narrative to be confirmed. And there it's confirmed. And that's why I say my mom is the hero of the book, because she's the force throughout the whole book of refusing to, to confirm um, false or wrong narratives and really forcing me through love to, to try to find the bravery to, recon, you know, to recast them. So, yeah. yeah. Um, are people getting driven nuts by the fact that she hasn't read anything yet? Oh. Well, I want to make, okay, great. The conversation is stimulating enough. <laughs> That's good because I have, I have my bookmarks in here and I thought we could read something, but I feel like we're, we're capturing it. So, uh, and reading the book is such an, an immense pleasure. So I strongly encourage you to do it. Um, if you, if you can buy a copy tonight and, and dive in, I have to, because my, my training is as, as a poet, uh, of course, I am. I'm really fixated on just the the stylistic aspects of it, the the, the construction of it, and just in some of the, the truly some of the beauty. Um, and and something that I realized as I was revisiting the book, which is sort of strange um, to pick up on from an author from Kansas, is just the recurrence of water. Sorry, mm -hmm. you have to indulge me some. some no, I, love I would this. call yeah. it poet bullshit. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I love but, it. Uh, so you know, there are just so many remarkable moments that happen. Around or near water in Cambodia, you you really have a connection with with somebody that that you've made there. It sort of ends ends by the water. One of the the amazing moments with your mother happens on a pier in Miami. Yeah, and I'm I'm wondering, you know, what is it about that setting? What what is it about that image that you've felt like it, maybe you didn't even realize it was sort of like lapping back at you all the, yeah. the time? Um, but but why do you think yeah. it's such a presence in the book? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about the symbols in the book. Water, that's a great thing to pick up on. Um, and also the sun is described in very specific ways and then trees um, and also very specific ways. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the most tense moments of change happen around water. Um, a, a moment with a dog that gets drowned in water um, and then the most sort of revelation or like revelatory moment with my mother on the beach. And I think that 
I mean, there's there's the easiest way to talk about why why water is important in terms of like the source of life, the source of of um, you know generating generation, like all these sorts of ways that water can kind of mean things um, to anybody in the same way. But but part of why I have so many of the sort of dangerous, intense moments around water is actually from this philosopher Bosanquet, who gives us the term easy and difficult beauty that the book is named for. And Bosanquet talks about easy beauty being beauty that arrives to us immediately. So a sunset or a rose or a piece of music that arrives to our ears and is very pleasant. But he also talks about difficult beauty, difficult beauty being beauty that will arrive to us only if we are patient, if we have a great mentor to teach us, if we are willing to sit with tension, complexity. But then the third thing he says is the hallmark of difficult beauty is this thing, and it's a technical term that he uses called width. And what he says width is, as he says, width is the moment, it's the experience of seeing for a moment how big the world is. And in seeing how big the world is, recognizing how small you are in comparison and how that is a disorienting and often unpleasant feeling to see that perspective shift because we walk around going like, I'm in my brain. I'm in I, I'm I, 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 um, everything is, is me. And then we have these things that happen where we go, oh, I am nothing. I am so small. And that for me, that happens the most at the ocean. Um, it is, or at mountain ranges too. So there's a lot about sort of the vastness of space. So you go to the ocean, if you sit in front of the ocean, there's no way to really truly take that in without going like, that is terrifying. The ocean is terrifying. It is forever. I am for but a second um, in comparison. It will kill me instantly. It is so much more powerful than me. Um, I'm terrified of it. And what Bosanquet says is the rare, it's the rare person who can sit in that moment. And instead of being terrified by the vastness of it and the smallness of you, can find actually beauty there. So I think when you look at a vast body of water, if you're really present with it, there is a moment of facing inevitably your mortality, um, its omnipresence, like its power over you, um, its timelessness and your extremely limited amount of time. And yet sometimes even with all that knowledge, we find great joy in the ocean or or swimming in Clinton Lake or canoeing around, you know, like we do. I mean, you can die in Clinton Lake. It's, you can die anywhere. So it's just, um, I think that the ocean to me is the sort of most potent symbol of width. And then also the sun is described very specifically because in philosophy, Plato often uses the sun as a metaphor for the truth. So you'll see that if you reread the book or look at the book, um, every time I describe the sun, I describe it in a way that represents my relationship to my truth at that time. So at the beginning of the book, the sun is abrasive. It's beating down on me. It's bleaching everything. It's a very harsh and brutal sort of force in my life because that's the time in which the truth is the hardest for me to grasp. The moment with my mother on the beach is we're looking at the width of the ocean and the sun is coming up gently and then the last moment, one of the last moments of the book is walking my son Wolfgang home under a very gentle, loving, embracing golden sort of hue that comes in in the autumn in New York in the sort of magical light. So there's a lot of intentionality with my use of sort of natural symbols and especially their relationship to the philosophical ideas that um, that I'm so deeply engaged with. Yeah, yeah. But then of course, the, the natural world necessarily for you collides with something like New York City. Yeah. And yeah. We've, we've talked about, you know, New York City as, as sort of like a, a sort of a gauntlet to throw down and, and, a, and a challenge. So mm -hmm. what has your experience been like, you know, living, surviving in New York City, falling in love with New York City, and, and also just trying to find beauty in that sort of landscape? Well, I mean, I think New York is, um, I think the first thing that really led me to New York is um, nobody cares about my body there. <laughs> it's a great, like, I'm just the least strange thing anybody's seen in any given day. And I can be invisible. And that's so great. Um, 
And I love being invisible. You know, I just, I'm not an object of inquiry. Um, I'm not stared at in the same way. I'm just like, um, you know, I'm just in people's way. They're just like, get out of the way, um, <laughs> move faster. And that's really liberating. Um, I love it. So, I mean, that has been an incredible thing. I think also New York is a place in which um, I'm constantly immersed in a culture that is encouraging my greatest ambitions, um, that is uh, extremely permissive to my ambitions, that wants me to work hard and all of my friends sort of surround me with that. And then it's also a place where I really wanted to raise my son because I thought, you know, whatever he's into, whoever he wants to be, he will find his people here. Um, and also the city becomes like a third parent in a lot of ways because there's so much that the city teaches him with the museums that we go to. We live right next to the Brooklyn Museum and Prospect Park and some of the greatest food from every possible culture. And so it took, it took my love of like the world and how expansive the world can be and we can fit a lot of that into our neighborhood. And that, that was an important place for me to raise Wolfgang. But we've also had this double, this sort of blessed, best of both worlds in that we also are so close to my mother who lives um, in Tonganoxi on a lot of land and around a lot of animals. And so Wolfgang has gotten to spend his life extremely deeply rooted to Kansas and riding horses and doing barn chores and, um, you know, mucking stalls and all the stuff I hated as a kid, but he loves and also gets to be in the city. And so that's something that this community has really given me is I could leave home, but always come home too. And that's, that's been a gift for Wolf for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Should we ask questions? We I would say, love to ask questions. Do you think they'll ask me any questions or? They look surly, but they look ready. So we I should just, we should give them a chance. Let's maybe. give them a yeah, shot. Let's see. Elliot, do you think? So uh, Elliot will come around with a, oh. Wolfgang I has first, first question, question. Coming from this young man right over here. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Chloe, I would love to. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I have a question for you, which is, how do you think personally? This might be too broad of a question, but how do you think your personal perception on disability, kind of as a whole, has changed? That's a great question. That's a great question. Well, I mean, the simplest way is um, to explain it is I don't feel like I have to pretend I'm not disabled anymore. And I did that for a long time because I thought other people were so uncomfortable with my body, which was true sometimes, that the work I needed to do was to get them to forget my disability. So that meant I couldn't write about disability. I couldn't talk about it. Uh, I mean, these weren't real rules. These were self-imposed rules, to be clear. So I would tell myself, don't talk about it. Don't admit that you're in pain. Don't ask for anything. Don't need anything never address disability. If someone was cruel to me, I would just pretend it wasn't happening. And I thought I had to do that in order to make people feel comfortable with me or in order to be really seen clearly by other people. I thought there was this sort of process of like, I have to wait until people unsee my body so that I, like a real me can be seen. And I think one of the biggest changes and the most profound changes is just recognizing that that set of beliefs, number one is of course like a very complicated um, and painful and unnecessary act of self erasure. That's problem number one. Problem number two is um, that, I, that I had to realize was um, if I just stopped doing that and I just tried to be authentically myself, and express myself authentically and not hide things or not do some sort of song and dance to make other people comfortable, but instead just was myself, that that gave an energy out or permission out to other people that invited them to be themselves. And then they became a little more comfortable talking to me. And then I became more comfortable. And then suddenly you're actually connecting. Um, and the openness or the vulnerability that I sought so desperately, of course, I was the thing blocking that. It wasn't my body. It was bad beliefs that were blocking that. 
So I think that's one of the huge ways that sort of thinking differently about disability and really embracing my disability as such a core positive part of my life and a complicated part of my life, but a completely crucial part of my life has given me um, the ability to, to be closer to so many people in my life. So that's one of the big ways. That's a good question, Great Wolfgang. Question. <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling a little self-conscious now. Uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. Other question? Thank you so much for this conversation and so many of the ideas that you're sharing. I can't wait to, to dig into the book. Um, I am really relating a lot to what you are saying um, in terms of that kind of self erasure mm -hmm. um, and my growing up experiences. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious as to how you see that related to, um, I think, Part of and and for me it it was in terms of hiding myself um, as um, as a black woman in a predominantly white school, yeah. um, but also um, hiding my um, sexual orientation, um, and um, part of it also had to do with being a child of immigrants, mm -hmm. a firstborn child who was bred to be a people pleaser and oh, a girl, yeah. right? Yeah. Like there were things that my brother could get away with that I could not. So I was wondering if you could talk about your experiences and how you started to recognize maybe some of those intersections of of gender or being an only child and and yeah. some of those, and being maybe from Kansas. I think totally. um, growing up in near to New York City, coming here when people were nice instead of like saying get out of the way i was like uh, what do you want like if someone said hello on oh, the street totally. i was like what well, not go yeah yeah <laughs> yes yes now when people are nice to me or make eye contact i'm like i'm not buying anything <laughs> from you well you were almost and you were almost a pre-new yorker before you moved <laughs> I think many people didn't think that you were from here. Your your general disposition. That's right. So I know. was yes, I think I was accused of not being Kansas nice all the time. So, but that's all right. That's why I went to New York. I'm the nicest person in New York. <laughs> <laughs> people are like you're so nice, and I'm like, well, um, uh, but no, I think what you're saying is so important because obviously we're talking a lot tonight about disability. But I think my book tries to look. Um, at the texture and the sort of all these sort of layers of the ways in which we are read or misread or miscategorized. And I think it's so brilliant, of course, um, to say it's not just disability, it's being a female with disability. I think it's being small, being short, that that generates a certain type of behavior toward me. I think it's the way that I walk too, that, that my walk is sort of precarious, looking to other people. So a lot of those things combine in the minds of some people as evidence of weakness and evidence of reasons why they need to remove my agency because I must be childlike. Um, it, it, it happens all the time where people sort of self or subconsciously will speak to me like a child, will get down real low and go, hi. Um, and I'll be like, not a real, not a whole, hold all. Um, and so I think there's, yeah, there's all these ways in which I physically present that, that is really complex. But I think being Midwestern is a really important part of it. And I think growing up in um, a space in which I didn't always feel like, um, well, I felt like, yeah, like, like my, my job was to be polite. And part of that's because you're going to see your neighbors a lot. And so there's some necessity in that. But growing up in a really small community in Tonganoxie meant that kind of everybody knew me, everyone knew my mom, everyone had a lot of ideas about me, and there was no way for me to be invisible. And when there's no way to be invisible, there's that makes it harder, or at least for me, just speaking for myself, to figure out who I really am and to break free of roles. And I think a big reason why this book is me traveling alone in places that are completely new to me is that that was the only way I could do like a radical breakage with my fixed roles in the world. 
not just my body or where I'm from or what kinds of expectations, who knows me, but also my role as a mother, my role as a wife, my role as a teacher, my role as a student, and all the, the weight that comes along with all of that. So it's like within each of us, we're carrying, you know, six, 10, 100 roles. And how do you break free of those roles? Um, other than you got to, you know, like, go to a Beyonce concert um, in Milan. I did that. That helped. Uh, go to a mountain. Um, but really to be in a place where nobody, where it's harder for people to assign things for on you. But of course, all these sorts of new things come. So it's just such a complicated navigation. And I don't think it's a navigation that any of us master in a lifetime. Um, because I think that the smartest people I know are people that are always working on that navigation as circumstances are changing. And I think in this book, all I managed to do is form self-awareness. That's it. And I think self-awareness leads to a little bit more agency over those roles, but it certainly feels like a lifelong ongoing process. Does it feel like that to you? Like it just keeps going. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I'm just curious because what going forward with your projects? Oh, yeah. Go, going forward with your projects now that you're working on, are you expanding? You, you mentioned sports, and I read that in your yeah. excerpt about the tennis, etc., in your book, and so on. But now you're explaining this. I mean, you, how do you see yourself going forward? In what direction with your writing, like in in a yeah. novel form? Are you involved in that at the moment, or is it kind of? Um, well, I sold two new books, so I have, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm on contract for two specific books, and the next one, which I'm pretty deep into and I've been drafting for a while, um, is about a giant painting. <laughs> and so I'm not writing about tennis. There's no tennis in that book, um, no sports in that book, but is about this massive painting um, called The Rose by Jay DeFeo, which my mother and I saw together when she came to visit me in New York in 2013. And it was a painting that I had never seen before and my mother didn't know, but we just sort of, we were on a walk with Wolfgang in a stroller. He was just so little then and kind of wandered into the Whitney and I saw this painting and felt that it was going to change my life and I didn't know how. Um, the painting was painted by a woman who worked on it every single day for eight years for 12 hours a day. It is um, almost 3,000 pounds, 12 feet high. It's all paint. Um, it ended up destroying her marriage, her house. Um, they had to take the um, bay window off of her house. She lost her job because she got arrested because she was stealing house paint. And um, the house paint gave, had lead in it, gave her cancer, and she died. Then when she died, they, the San Francisco Art Institute took the painting and put it in a wall and lost it for 25 years. And I said, um, I understand this because I was like the burden of women's art and ambition kills everybody around them and themselves. Uh, <laughs> so that's book number two. <laughs> Do you ever think about outer space? I mean, because <laughs> <laughs> all the crazy stuff that's going on. That's about as sure, enormous yeah. as it gets, yeah, right? Sure, if you're talking yeah. width, that's uh, yeah, outer that's space. Infinite, that's infinite terrifying, width, right? Yeah. I mean, all these rocket things yeah. and you know, they want to get people off to Earth. That's the. Their... I'll go. Is that? Are you pitching me an assignment or? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't work on one myself. Yeah. Outer space is book four. It'll be in your not my lifetime, but your son's your life, your lifetime. This is happening. This yeah. is really <laughs> gonna do this stuff. Yeah. They want us to go to Mars and live there. I'll go. <laughs> oh, you're just gonna have to drag a twelve hundred pound painting somehow onto a rocket ship. True. Uh, yeah, I couldn't leave the thing. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Or can we go? We can go. Yeah. Yeah, um, we'll get you on the mic so that they can 
hear you on the live stream. Uh, so I'm just curious, and admittedly, I know not very much about this particular topic, but I've heard people talk about something called body neutrality. Mm. Do you have any opinions on that? It's it's no, sort of like tell an me more about it? of like the body positivity movement that instead of having to feel a particular, you know, search for something sort of mm. uh, positive in everything and in how you accept yourself, that you can take a more, I guess – it seems like a detached, personally, kind of a detached person. Body ambivalence almost. Yeah, ambivalence. So I just was curious what your thoughts were and how that sort of... I don't know much about this movement um, at all. You're telling me about it for the first time. I mean, I do think that there's something toxic in forcing yourself to be positive about something, and there's toxic in, in somebody convincing you to feel negatively about your body. I'm less interested in any generic or generalized term at all I'm interested in like um, Chloe body mind specificity. <laughs> um, I'm interested in why my, for myself, my body creates a dynamic, ever changing, important, vital, urgent, complex, sometimes difficult relationship um, that is the self, that is me. So I feel no pressure to feel positive about my body. I would like to feel less shame unless I've earned it. Um, But what I am really interested is like understanding the nuances and complexities of why my body makes me me. And that does include looking at the ways that the world has informed that self-image. But I don't, I don't really ascribe to any, I think anytime somebody's talking about like a big concept like that, um, I feel that that is like a grasping of of meaning that is like avoiding the messy specificity of the self. So I don't know. Maybe it's good though. I don't know. And, I yeah. Mean, and and the uh, and the physicality. I mean, I, yeah. I I feel like you you're deciding to in any of those ways omit another another access point of experience that yeah. your body affords you. Um, and, and I think it would be really, I mean, definitely your book is not going to, um, is not going to push somebody into feeling one of those sort of very hard and fast feelings about yeah. body positivity, body negativity. No, body, yeah, that's not, it, yeah. I, I don't imagine somebody reading your book and, and coming to any of those conclusions. Totally. Course. Yeah. No, I don't think my book is about body positivity at all. I think it is about self-awareness. Um, and the search for self-awareness. Actually, now as I'm talking, I feel like I'm really anti this body neutrality. All- yeah, I'm like, I, I was like, I have no opinion. I don't care, but I do care. I don't, I, how can you be neutral about well, your butt? Like, I, that seems like, yeah. you know, like, a, yeah, a dissociative state. Yeah. Again, and I don't it, know it, anything. Yeah. And it admit- Yeah. 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 I think so. I do yeah. think it's a reaction to the body positivity. positivity. Yeah. <laughs> the one article I read, it was more. Oh, Kiki, no. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. But talk. Like, yeah, I think body positivity can be really toxic too. It's yeah. like not. It's not as empowering as I think it. It's meant to be sometimes, or some aspects of it. Of so, I like that. I like the pushing against that. But I guess my argument would be like push deeper into specific concepts rather than more generalizations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we're, of course, we're all, there are as many ages reflected here in the audience. And, but the one thing that we all share is we're all getting older. And I know, I, I don't know who, who first said this, but, um, you know, disability is one of those identities that we all sort of ultimately move toward yeah. right, as we age. Um, That's, it, yeah. it, it's, it's some, it's, it's a community that we will all be a part of. And I'm still fairly young, but just as I notice myself changing, it, it's hard to be ambivalent or positive or negative about this body because every second that I'm in it, I'm thinking of, I'm so, of some other aspect of it. It's, it's constantly being tilted yeah. this way and that. And, and, uh, it, it almost strikes me as something that you have to have a lot of privilege to be able to say, I'm not going to think about my body anymore. Yeah. Um, Disability is winning. It means you've lived a really long life. Like if you're not disabled now, if you get to live a long life, you will be, or something will happen to you and 
and being kind with yourself and, and having an understanding of your body's inevitable shift and change over time. Like that's a big part of, I think, um, preparing yourself for, for the inevitable. But I mean, I, I hope that I get to live a very, very, very long life, which means this body, this form, this mind is going to be ever in flux. And I'm going to have to face that with as much self-acceptance as bravery or, you know, as possible. Because so. what you're saying is I can't wait to have more pain, right? I can't, well, I can't yeah. wait. I can't wait to have pain, further struggles, yeah. right? Because that's life. That's being alive. You know, it's like, yeah, like, if you really love life, that means you're like, yeah, I'm in for pain and struggle and grief. It's all, that's all part of the picture. See, yeah. now we're on the couch. Okay, it took now us we're, like a, is, took us an feeling, hour yeah. and 15 minutes, but now we're in the live on the living room couch. This so. does fit. Yeah. That's probably where we should stop. Though. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the delivery guy just rang the doorbell and the yeah, pizza's here. Yeah. So um, we should all, uh, you know, enjoy a slice maybe or her book, which is for sale back there and enjoy each other's company. Um, so thank you so much for being here. And thank you to Chloe. Thank you. That was incredible. Thank you. Really I, fun. I really want to say thank you to you, Giselle. Thank you for making this happen. And thank you to the Hall Center. And I'm just so glad I get, you know, because I knew Giselle when I was a student here. And it's an amazing full circle moment to come back. And so I really appreciate you bringing me. Thank oh, you're you. welcome. And I'm so thankful that you were able to come and that we could make the schedule work. And I, yeah. you've been so incredibly busy and, <laughs> you know, all over cycling um, through your book tours. And thank you to Justin. I think it was just, I love the dynamic um, of the conversation. Justin, so. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. And um, feel free if um, you were too shy to ask a question on the mic to, to come up and um, carry on the conversation for a little while longer. Um, books are for sale in the back. And I think we have a few free copies of Disability Visibility if you'd like to pick one of those up as well. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you.